Thank you very much indeed. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so everybody has seen this slide countless times probably. Um, just a repeat that Africa has the highest rate of uh, drowning de deaths per 100,000 population um, amongst the world's regions. And there must be reasons for this notoriety. So I'd like to um, look at those before I get into how we are poised to take advantage of this uh, report. But maybe just to begin with the obvious that actually Africa is a very diverse continent. It's a very heterogeneous continent. And that even when I say Africa, I'm sure everybody has a different imagination of what I'm going to speak about or what Africa is about. So right from the Cape um, to the Mediterranean Rim, for instance, or from the Atlantic where you can drink a dry savanna to the magic of the East African coast. This is all Africa, it's very diverse, but as you can see, a very extensive shoreline, lots of um, opportunity or exposure to risk of drowning. But this ex extensive shoreline is, not, is certainly not the only reason that we have um, a lot of exposure. Uh, inland Africa, as you can see, also has plenty of water. So the, the huge basins, the Zambezi, the Congo Basin, the Nile Basin. So even while we have the deserts that some of you think about, we also have huge quantities of uh, natural um, bodies of water in the, inside the continent. But if we look more closely at the East African side of the continent, which is where most of my examples are going to come from, you realize that we actually have plenty of in, inland water. So you can see that almost continuous stretch from Lake Tanganyika in Malawi into Tanganyika, up the crater lakes on the western side of Uganda, beautiful crater lakes, huge Lake Victoria, the second largest uh, freshwater lake in the world. So a lot of exposure to natural bodies of water. If we look a little more closely, this is uh, zooming into Uganda, you actually see that there's a dense network of rivers and there are many more that don't even show up on this map. So lots of, of water certainly do explain the exposure to drowning. But this is not the whole reason. So I'd like to examine a few other reasons and one of them that comes to mind, of course, is the population growth. So this is another graph that shows the population growth rate per continent. And you can see again that Africa is growing at a much faster rate than the next fastest growing uh, region, which is the Latin America. In fact, it is more than twice the rate, meaning that there are lots and lots of young Africans. The continent is actually the youngest continent, lots of young people. What are these young people doing? So another factor that would probably come into play is where these young people are going. So on the left, you see that Africa is actually still um, the least urbanized. But if you look on the right, you see that uh, over time, Afri the, the population of Africans that are living in towns and cities has actually overtaken other huge um, uh, urbanizing regions like India. Certainly it has way overtaken uh, North America. Meaning that there are huge numbers of very young Africans that are moving from villages into towns and cities. But they're not moving into affluence. They're actually quite often moving into the most disadvantaged parts of the cities, they are moving onto wetlands, they are moving into areas that are already prone to, to flooding, mm -hmm. and they are living in very inadequate housing. Um, so you can see that even when generally there is a downward trend in the rate of urbanization, the rate at which people are moving from villages into towns and cities, Africa is still way on top. So if we think about what we know generally, and we don't know a whole lot about why people are drowning this continent, um, first we acknowledge that from some of the studies, even you know, those that we've done in Uganda, that adults tend to predominate in drownings that are of an occupational nature or due to transportation. But in other settings, uh, certainly in uh, small studies from countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, that 
there's a tendency for most of the drownings to be happening in children, which is maybe not very surprising, given what we've just said about the age of this continent. Male more than female, rural more than urban. Most of the drownings seeming to happen in open natural bodies of water. And except for South Africa and the Mediterranean, actually when we look at trauma registries um, and deaths happening in, in hospitals, in health facilities, we do not see any drownings, meaning whatever is going to happen, patients don't usually get into the hospital uh, to make, to be, um, the documentation doesn't happen in hospitals. So another slide that people have seen uh, enough times, but this is what I'm going to now try and interrogate, how Africa is poised to take advantage of these interventions that we all agree are probably going to lead to a reduction in drowning rates. Um, and I'll look at them one by one. So let's first look at providing safe places away from water for preschool children. So this adorable picture, you know, is where we'd all like these very young kids to be in a place where they have an adult that's watching over them, where they, they are certainly staying out of trouble and, and not at risk of drowning. But I'd like to use an example from uh, Uganda. So this is a population pyramid from Uga in Uganda, data from 2015. And as you can see, this is a very young country. So close to 50% of Ugandans are actually under the age of 18, uh, the age of 14. And if we look at that group that we'd like to keep away from water, these are below the age of five, it's a whole 20%, close to 20% of the entire population. So a very huge number of kids that we'd like to keep away from water in a country where there's probably not enough adults to go around. If we look more closely at that population, we'll see that 57% of the Ugandan population is actually children. It's people under the age of 18. And if we look at the population that we'd like to keep away from water, in real numbers, it's close to seven million children. So seven million children are below the age of five in a population of 36 million people. And their siblings who are five through 14, who we are going to teach how to swim and water, be safe around water, are uh, over 10 million people. Uh, if we compare this to a population like Japan, Japan doesn't even have a population pyramid, it has more popul a tower <laughs> of sorts. So Japan, with its 127 million people, actually has far fewer children that are below the age of five than Uganda with its 37, 36 million people. And this has implications for how many adults are going to be watching over these children and somehow managing to keep them away from water. So what, what opportunities can we see here? Um, if, if we think in terms of dense peri-urban communities, where lots of families live close together, then we can, we can imagine that a crash is probably something feasible that is going to be able to address drowning, that indeed parents are going to bring their preschool children into homes such as the one that I just showed where little kids are together writing, and that they will deal with drowning prevention, but they also have advantages like preventing other childhood unintentional injuries, child maltreatment, and they'll indeed contribute to um, early years education. But if we think about rural areas, which is where the majority of Africans still live, then maybe there's going to be a, a bit of a challenge there because the three and four year olds are actually already being recruited into the domestic workforce and they're actually already going out to get water. So the idea that you can, that you should keep them away from water is probably not going to be a good one. And as you can see from, so I think in Africa, this is what we'd call open access. <laughs> so there's certainly open access to this water. And anybody that can move can get to this water. And that includes preschool children. Now, if you look at this picture, I think majority of people in this room who have any sense of Africa will know that these little kids with their containers on their heads are actually 
the equivalent of water pipes. This is how water gets into the homesteads. In little containers on the heads of small kids. Meaning that the small kids actually have to have access to water. And that it is probably unreasonable for us to think that it's going to stop because we fear that they might drown. So how are we going to deal with it? I think if we first realize that most exposure is to bodies of water that are not easily fenced or covered, then we're going to have to rethink what it means to deny access to small kids uh, who have to go to wells and to streams that are used as sources of water, especially in communities where, well, the governments are still trying to figure out if they should put in pipe water or buy more firearms. So if we think about playpens, then I think some of you who've seen the playpens from um, Bangladesh, for instance, again, we think, so if they have, if 20% of the Ugandan children are below the age of five, there's a likelihood that actually a mother could have three, four children below the age of five. This is not fiction. So where are they going to put the playpens? And how are they going to move three kids, maybe leave one child in a playpen, and then take two kids and move a kilometer to a neighbor's house, go and leave the kids there for three hours while they go to the market. So the practicality is probably not going to allow that to happen. And I think we leave swimming pools alone. So if we think about the reality of this, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily where the bulk of the children drown, but I'm just giving this as an example, then I think we have to get to the reality that we should think not so much about keeping kids away from water as to making their access to water safer. And there could be different ways we can do this. Um, so just thinking if they have to get access to water, then maybe there should be a way we can make this water access safer. If we move on to teaching kids how to swim, that's the, the next strata, that's 30% of the Ugandan children. Again, we're thinking, so how do we choose which of those kids, 10, 11 million kids, are actually truly most vulnerable to drowning? Because clearly not all of them are going to, be, to have the same vulnerability. So even assuming that one in four children have a very high risk of drowning, and it's just a figure that I, you know, I put out of the air, then we still have about two and a half million children that we're going to teach how to swim in a country that has less than 100 trained swimming instructors, all of who live in urban areas away from the kids. Now, from our own research, we know that less than that less than 50% of adults that actually live on water and fishing communities actually know how to swim. So away from the lakes, then we don't even have enough adults that know how to swim, let alone how to teach children how to swim or how to stay safe around water. Um, I'd like to look at building resilience and managing flood risks and other similar hazards. So, these are not canals. <laughs> These are regular streets in Kampala city after a torrential downpour. And this is not a rare sight. This is happening more and more. Virtually every rainy season, there are going to be days when these streets are flooded. And the flooding doesn't happen over a long period of time. You know, it could happen over a span of three, two, three hours. These streets are flooded. So kids go out, it's dry. And on their, way, on their return, uh, the roads are impassable. So, how do these communities then build resilience in order to protect these masses of young kids that are on the roads um, walking in, in unpredictable environments? This is another um, suburb close to Kampala, and you can see in the background um, the homes on the hills, but the most vulnerable people will be the ones that live in the valleys where the drowning is most likely to happen. But it's not only restricted to cities. Actually, this is um, an incident that happened on the 26th of September, where after torrential downpour, homes were washed down the hillside and their occupants died. And this was not even a rescue attempt because there was nobody to rescue. All of the people had died in the swamps. 
So this is happening more and more, and we have come to the realization that, um, that indeed, whether the communities are rural or urban, that they, their resilience to, to flooding and to risk of drowning are really being stretched. So whether that flooding comes as a result of torrential rains or groundwater flooding or um, blocked drains because you know people that don't have um, sufficient uh, waste disposal are actually living in areas where that waste needs to get out and it doesn't. You know this kind of, of flooding is getting more frequent and more severe um, with every passing year. So this is a um, proposal that I borrowed from uh, Ian Douglas that is looking at, so what kind of responsibility can be taken to mitigate this kind of, of uh, drowning and looking at the household where the drowning is not too extreme and so every household should probably have a way they can deal with drowning to um, more severe drowning that involves neighborhoods, that involves cities, up to the point where we need to involve um, governments and maybe intergovernmental agencies, um, acknowledging that communities are going to be vulnerable and they might have certain ways they can cope, but uh, in many ways, if it's extreme, then governments are going to have to come in and help them to, to survive this risk. Um, so if we think about training bystanders in safe rescue and research station, and I think by, by far the largest group uh, of people in the room are engaged in this, then we, we have to think about who are the bystanders? Where are they standing when the drowning is happening or about to happen? Um, so in the case of um, the Lake Victoria Basin, we actually know that it's been tried, that in the fishing communities, um, uh, fisher folk that have um, maybe not, not a great deal of education have actually been successfully taught um, search and rescue and they've done it successfully within their settings, uh, although the evaluations have not been too rigorous. But in many other settings, we really don't know uh, away from the fishing communities who the most appropriate uh, bystanders would be and what kind of training they'd need and how well they'd retain those skills and many other things that we need to know in, in order for us to invest in, in that. Um, with regard to uh, enforcing safe boating, fishing and ferry regulations, so this is not Photoshop, this is real pictures of just people getting about their daily commute and I'm sure you can imagine that it could be made far safer than it is. Um, safe boating, this is um, beautiful Lake Victoria, where thousands upon thousands of these small boats actually ply the lake, uh, both as regular transportation between um, the islands and the mainland and um, as part of the fishing industry. There's absolutely no regulation in terms of the manufacturing of these boats equipping the boats, training who um, sells the boats, how to load them, or anything. So well, I think here there's plenty of opportunity with regard to what's in the recommended in the report. And there's also an opportunity in the existence of the Lake Victoria Basin Commission. There's actually a commission that exists uh, around Lake Victoria to, uh, for conservation and sustainable utilization of the lake's resources, but it also states specifically that it's for the maintenance of navigational safety and maritime security. And I think this is a real opportunity for these countries. There's been in existence since 2007 uh, a Lake Victoria Transport Act that um, lays down very specific regulations regarding all of the things that I've said, for instance, about boating, about um, how the boats are manufactured and how they are managed and so on and so forth. So it, it, it provides a potential then for harmonizing laws, regulations and enforcement on a whole number of things, um, controlling alcohol, use of um, life jackets and so on and so forth. But it also means that I think those of us in the room and many other people that are concerned with this have to really engage with this commission that is right now very concerned with how to get revenue from the lake without necessarily providing safety for those that use the lake. 
Um, so I'd, I'd like to make a few concluding remarks. And certainly there are lots of opportunities that exist from the global report on uh, drowning prevention for Africa. Uh, if I've used extreme examples to make the point, there still is, um, I, I think, a lot of learning for us to do. And I think countries need to invest in identifying who is at greatest risk of drowning, where they are, why they are at risk, if we are going to be able to do anything about it. Uh, we need to understand communities' responses to the threat of drowning. We need to understand what their resiliences are, what their strengths are, and if there's anything we can harness from there and build upon in order to um, increase resistance against drowning, the threat of drowning. We need to prioritize feasible uh, interventions that can reduce drowning, um, especially to the most vulnerable. And we need to look for opportunities to to, to take advantage of collaborations and partnerships between different sectors, for instance, transportation, fishing, telecommunications, uh, health, um, education, uh, especially where you have large numbers of children that are school age, even if they might not necessarily be in school. Uh, so all these are opportunities that are offered that we could not begin to take advantage of the global report on drowning prevention until we have done some work. And I think my presentation has been a long and rather roundabout way of saying we really don't know enough in order to take advantage of this report. And we need to go home, do our homework, and then come back with real answers. Thank you very much. <laughs>